getting a data science internship at like a, a place that is a little bit not super traditional is like a really, really good option, even if you don't want to be there long term, because you can learn a lot, you can probably impact the business a lot because they haven't had a thousand data scientists going over all their data all the time. So there's a lot more like low hanging fruit. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Tyler Richards. Tyler is a data scientist at Facebook who recently published a book on the Python library Streamlit. The book is called Getting Started with Streamlit for Data Science. He graduated from the University of Florida in 2018, and he worked on election integrity problems for nonprofits and research labs while there. In this episode, Tyler discusses how he landed a job at Facebook from a non-target school, his experience working in the nonprofit space, and why he enjoys Streamlit so much that he wanted to write a book on it. To that point, today we're giving away three free copies of Tyler's book, Getting Started with Streamlit for Data Science. Comment below with why you want to learn Streamlit for a chance to win. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I know I enjoyed talking to Tyler. Tyler, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast today. We talked before, you have such an interesting story coming from a non-target school. You also just released a book on Streamlit, one of my favorite platforms. We've had Adrian on the show to talk about talk about the, the platform as well, which is incredible. And so I'm really glad to be able to continue that story with your education on the topic. Uh, you also work at Facebook, which I think is a company a lot of people are interested in hearing out, uh, hearing how to break into. So really excited for you to share your journey today. And thank you again for coming in. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited to talk about uh, all of everything. Facebook is definitely either always in people's interests or always in the news. So there's always something to talk about there. And yes. obviously with Streamlit, like, yeah, Streamlit's so fun. I, I, I just like really delighted with the library enough that I wrote a book about it. So yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Heck yes, that's what I like to hear. So one of the first things I always ask guests is how you first got interested in data or the technical domain? Was it a pivotal event that happened to you or was it a slow progression towards finding yourself in the space? Yeah, it was definitely a slow progression. So um, I went to the University of Florida, uh, which is in Gainesville, Florida. And a lot of like, my original interest, maybe I was like a freshman or a sophomore, was kind of focused in the political realm. Um, and so I, I was uh, in, you know, a bunch of engineering classes, but I had this kind of side interest in politics. And so I would sit in on these like uh, political science classes. Um, and I also had a bunch of uh, stats classes, uh, you know, in my engineering degree. And they were just kind of answering a lot of questions that are, there was just like this, this toolkit of statistics that I just thought was so interesting in answering questions that I actually cared about. So when I remember one of the first um, like quote unquote data science problems that I worked on was I was trying to figure out if I could predict um, where the, uh, which, like who is gonna win a student government election or something like that. Um, and so I just used a fairly basic regression. I like grabbed a bunch of data that was available on the US website. And then I was able to um, predict like something like um, 48 out of the 50 Senate seats that happened like that year. And it was mostly because like the elections weren't that competitive. Like it wasn't a super competitive election, but I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Like I actually like really enjoy uh, this as a toolkit. Um, and yeah, then maybe, you know, six years later or so, seven years later, here I am. <laughs> There's Incredible a lot of stuff in between stuff. those two points, but that's how I at least I got interested in it. I love that. Well, let's start filling in some of the stuff that happened in between those two points. You know, what what was your career evolution? I know that UF, you described to me before, is not necessarily a target school for some of these big tech companies. How did you go from there, which is still a very good institution, uh, but how did you go from there to break into your current role? And what was that process like for you? Yeah, um, so the uh, to give a bit more um, background, kind of what happened after those uh, um, original data science kind of projects that I had was I, when I was sitting in in a lot of these political science classes, um, uh, one of them, um, there's this like one pivotal class where the uh, professor like handed out a, a, a pop quiz. And I don't know if I said this before, but I wasn't actually in the class. Like I was just sitting in on the class. Um, and so I took the quiz and I, uh, cause I didn't know what else to do. Um, and I went up to the professor and I was like, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, like, I'm not actually in your class, but I took the quiz anyway. Like, what do you want me to do with it? And he was very confused. He's this nice professor um, named Dan Smith. 
And he was like, oh, uh, well, would you like to do research with me? Because <laughs> he was like, oh, this is great. And then I did research with him for years. He found, like, he obviously found out I could code and do some engineering stuff. And so then there was a lot of, like, um, uh, I did a lot of computational social science work within his lab. Um, and then that gave me a lot of, lot of experience because it was a domain that I really cared about. Um, and I got to apply a lot of um, statistical techniques and like very generic machine learning stuff, help them build databases and do analyses. Um, and that actually got me my first um, kind of bigger consulting job um, while I was in an undergrad and then right after undergrad as well. Um, but it really gave me this like the, both the projects and the kind of research in a domain that I cared about gave me a lot of experience that I could talk about in interviews. Um, just because mostly people could actually see the work that I had done. It, was, it wasn't just me saying, oh yeah, I can do regression or like I can do machine learning, which like anyone can put on a resume. Um, and you know, you're the goes. second person from Facebook who has done pretty good, a pretty good amount of research at school. That's something yeah. that is a common thing. I only know a, a couple of, of you, of you all, but it's interesting to me to see it. something about your research that I also found very interesting was like, you weren't doing computer science research, right? You were yeah. leveraging the machine learning or the coding skills that you developed and applying them to a different domain. I think that there's a lot of uh, departments at universities that want someone who can run the analysis, who can do the statistics, and you don't necessarily have to be a political science major to do that. You don't have to be a biology major to, to come in with that skill set and be a part of that research. Those are opportunities I think a lot of people don't necessarily see or look for because they don't know that they're there. Yeah, it's actually better if you're not a political science student or a biology uh, student um, and you're trying to get like research in those labs because um, I mean, even within like working at Facebook now, I see how valuable software engineers are like software engineers and data scientists, but especially software engineers, um, at least at like big tech companies are so hard to find. Um, and they're so valuable and data scientists as well. It's like really, really hard to find folks that can really like answer data questions well. Um, and there's just not enough of them. And so I, it's the same situation happens at all these different labs where like if you can find someone that is actually quite good or even reasonably good and has some experience in like running Python scripts or running R scripts or something, um, you're just going to be so far ahead if you're competing against um, people that have never coded before, which are like the, probably the majority of political science students or the biology students. Whereas you, it's so much harder to stand out to professors in computer science everyone there codes so you have to be a really good coder but yeah. no one in these other department codes so the your competition is like way easier i don't know if this level. might be some foreshadowing and how to approach the job process as well uh, you know looking at opportunity looking looking in areas where less people are or less there's less competitive things but i will let you continue uh from where you started to break into consulting uh yeah so uh the I started doing, while I was an undergrad, you kind of, you can get hired full time, but it's like kind of rare. Um, and there was this uh, nonprofit that was called uh, Protect Democracy and what they were doing, which was, and still are doing, they're a, a great um, uh, nonprofit in the space is essentially every state has their own database on who is allowed, who is registered to vote in that state. Um, and it's run, each one is run by the state and they don't talk to other states almost at all. And so you essentially have these 50 databases that are built completely independent of each other with different columns. They keep different information. They update at different times. They have um, like, yeah, they're, they're in different formats. So it's not even just like, oh, some are in CSV formats and some are in like actual databases. It's like some of them are split by um, uh, the like, so there's one, there's one database that is split by the number of spaces so the first it's just one big string and the first six spaces are always the first name or the first 10 spaces are always the first name the next 10 spaces are always the last name like it's a nightmare that's the point i'm just trying to say it's an absolute nightmare it's bonkers um and so what they were basically trying to do is uh, and it's so valuable to have like what is the voter registration data for florida and in the same format as these other states um 
And so basically that problem has been solved by these big political data firms that can spend a bunch of money to hire a bunch of data engineers and data scientists to like figure all that out. And the nonprofit was like, well, what if we did this, you know, um, like if, what if we were actually able to do this and we're able to like do a bunch of interesting analyses on it? Um, and they wanted, they wanted to basically do anomaly detection for when people were getting kicked off of the voter rolls, which happens for very reasonable reasons like people die and you have to make sure that they like can't vote or people move to other states and there's a bunch of good reasons. But also a really like easy way of affecting an election is just kicking people off the voter rolls if you were able to like hack into it. Um, and so that is what the entire nonprofit did. And it was a very long explanation to explain what the nonprofit did, but that background is really interesting to me anyway. Um, and so like my background in, in that, like doing that sort of stuff for Florida data was so valuable to them. Um, and so I got introduced to the right people that actually read a medium post that I had written on the um, election prediction and they let me like bypass all of the technical rounds because they had seen work that I had done. They were like, yeah, do you just want to start coming working for us? Um, and I said, yeah. And so then I started uh, started working for them and I, I worked for them um, both my junior and senior year. Uh, and then also like um, a bit after college in New York um, before I before I joined Facebook. Um, yeah. I, th I think it's so cool you were able to find a role that was at the intersection of a couple of the things you were interested in, obviously the data component, as well as the political landscape. And I think not enough people sort of choose a couple of things rather than choose just one. It's like, oh, I wanna work in data science. That makes it really difficult for you as an individual to decide where to go. And it also makes it a lot more difficult for companies to employ you if that's the only skill set that you're bringing to the table, right? There's a lot more data scientists out there than there are data scientists who have experience or uh, or interest or more knowledge about the political landscape or political science or whatever it might be, right? Like from their perspective, if you're applying to a certain role with those two skills or those two experiences, you're going to be more valuable to them. Although you might have less broader opportunities, there's yeah. still plenty of opportunities out there. It's not like you're going to apply to every job that's out there on the planet as a data scientist anyway. Anyway, so it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting to see how those two things that like, oh, I'm limiting my options. Actually, you're increasing your probability of landing a role in a certain sphere that you likely care more about. And yeah, you might have less options, but your odds of getting employed, I think, still go up dramatically. Well, it's just a math problem, right? Like I, it is harder for me to become the top 1% of data scientists than it is for me to be the top five or 10% of data scientists in two, and like data scientists and political scientists. So it's way easier for me to be, I'm a top 10 data scientist, top 10% data scientist, and a top 10% political scientist. And you combine those Venn diagrams together and I'm, I'm all of a sudden in the top 1% of that pool. But if I'm just trying to be, and that's way easier to do than if I'm just in the top, you know, than to get as a, like a top 1% data scientist. So I, I view a lot of this stuff as like, looking at the overlapping Venn diagrams that don't overlap very much and then being like really good in each one of those subsets of pools. And then once those start to overlap, like it's way, way easier to be a competitive candidate when you have those um, multiple skill sets. Um, yeah, so I, I, I totally agree. There's like that, which is a more strategic thing. And also I think it's a big motivation thing as well, where I'm interested in learning more about data science because it can answer problems that I actually care about. Where if I'm just like, oh, I wanna learn a new model today. Like, oh yeah, I really wanna understand how random forests work. And I don't have a problem that it's actually trying to solve for me. Then it's just kind of like, you might be a little bit interested in it, but if you're not having fun with it, if you're not actually interested in like answer, answering a problem that you care about, you're just always gonna lose in comparison to someone that is having fun with it. Um, because they're going to do it more. Like if you if you view it as like, oh yeah, yeah, I just think if you have fun with the stuff that you're doing, you're going to be better at it. Well, they're also going to have something to show for it, right? Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. just uh, you're know, like trying to understand how random forest works, if you're not applying it to data, or or you probably would still be applying it to data, but like you're you can tell a story with that random forest, right? You can you can put something out there. It can be in your GitHub repo. It can be on Kaggle. Whereas if you're just learning it to learn the technology or the algorithm, the product 
from that isn't isn't going to be nearly as interesting to anyone on the outside. Yeah, I remember we were we were talking about this before um, about um, like the Titanic data set and how I think you you told me about someone that used it for actually like an interesting purpose um, with like insurance and like properly pricing uh, uh, like boat insurance which is incredible and so fun, but for basically any other use, it's like not a good way yeah. of spending your time is like, yeah. <laughs> but well, anything other than that, like using generic data sets is just doesn't seem like an amazing use of time. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I will say, I think the generic data sets are good for learning some of the basics. Like, for sure. you know, I, I did Titanic. I did uh, the it's mince number data set. And I think that they added value, not to my portfolio, but to my learning. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, like, unless you're putting a crazy spin, like, no employer is going to be like, oh, my goodness, you did the Titanic data set. We've got to hire yeah. this guy. Like, oh. yeah. Give him $100,000 right now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that the Z line can come standard with Linux, and they also can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right into the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. All right, so uh, let's jump back into your career. I realize we're jumping a little bit, but hopefully the listeners will, will bear with us because uh, uh, I'm loving the some of the, the nuance that you're, you're able to add here about, about the journey. Uh, but but what was next? Was Facebook next? Was there things in between? What was that process like? Yeah, like simultaneous with the, the consulting um, for the Protect Democracy group, I'd also tried to start um, getting internships at places as a data scientist. Um, and that was uh, definitely difficult. Um, I applied to so many places and I would just get rejected like again and again. Um, before I got Facebook, like the, I when and that was at the full time role level where I'd already had a couple data science internships and like some experience basically as a full time software engineer and data scientist. So I felt like I had an amazing, like relatively to my peers, I felt like really good about my search. Um, I was getting rejected like left and right. My acceptance rate for interviews was like 5% or something like, you know, one in 20, I, they would even talk to me or anything. Um, and so that was incredibly, incredibly difficult, but to back it up a half second, I did a couple other like internships in data science as like a data science intern. Both of them were for a big company called Procter and Gamble. Um, and they make like Tide and Bounty and, um, Swiffer and everything. They're a massive, massive, massive company. Um, and I, I view, um, it is like a really good idea for a lot of candidates to try and get a data science internship at a. Um, I'll call it like a second tier place. It's not actually second tier because you really are doing data science. They really need data scientists. Um, but, it's not but a in tech terms company, of per se. yeah, it's not a tech company. Like you're not at like Airbnb or something. Um, uh, shout out to Airbnb. They have beautiful stuff everywhere. <laughs> All their data scientists. I, it's awesome. They rejected me so many times, but <laughs> one of these days. Um, uh, yeah. So at, at a getting a data science internship at like a a place that is a little bit not super traditional is like a really, really good option, even if you don't want to be there long term, because you can learn a lot, you can probably impact the business a lot because they haven't had a 1000 data scientists going over all their data all the time. So there's a lot more like low hanging fruit, like the project that I was working on um, was trying to was doing a product recommendation for Costco um, and, and other like big block retailers. So like PNG can choose what type of products to put on the shelf and um, they can go to Costco and say, hey, would you please sell Bounty? Or they could also, instead of that, they could say, hey, would you please sell Tide Pods? And Costco is like really harsh on um, which products actually get on their shelf. They have a bunch of like really cool requirements where they have like quality requirements, which a place like Walmart basically doesn't have. Walmart will put anything on their shelf. And there's like so many different products, but Costco is like super specific and you can only make a certain amount. Like you have to prove to Costco that you're not like making a big margin on this product. Otherwise they won't put it on the shelf, which is amazing. They're like, you cannot make more than 2% in this category. 
And they're like, if you're making more than 2%, like stop, like you're not, we're not going to put it on the shelf because you're gouging our customers. It's amazing. Um, 75% of their profit, I think it's like 50 or 75%, some really large percent of their profit comes from membership and not selling stuff. So they pass all, so they're mean to suppliers and they pass all the savings on to their customers, which is why their customers have a retention rate like in the 90s, which is insane, like outlandish. I would um, practically I love, love it. at Costco. I, there's one a mile from my house. So. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah, Isn't great. it great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. people I, get really into it. Do you have the little black membership and all this stuff, or what do you have? Oh, yeah. Uh, executive membership, Quan. Yeah, 2% cash membership. back, baby. <laughs> amazing. On the credit card. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready, yeah. Yeah. So a single product on the shelf at, like, some of the big Costcos will make, like, millions of dollars a year with, like, they'll sell millions of dollars of, like, a product. Um, because there's so few like number, unique number of products. There are more unique products in a Walmart, um, in one aisle of a Walmart makeup um, section than there are in the entirety of a Costco. Like, wow. like unreal the scale difference between these two, where one is unlimited selection, you can have whatever you want, we'll put all the different products on there. And Costco is like, you want peanut butter? Here's your peanut butter. <laughs> like, this is this is your peanut butter. We might have a few flavors or whatever else, but like this is this is what it is. This is best in the business. Yeah. Although their olive oil selection isn't bad, they have a couple different ones, which is surprising. Yeah, me, so. but they don't have hundreds. <laughs> like they if you, you go to yeah. Walmart, they've got like three hundred olive oils. Oh, easily, easily. Yeah, huh. yeah. It's interesting so anyway, business perspective, mm -hmm. the two different models. I love that. So cool, so cool. I'm a big, big fan of Costco and Sam's Club as well. Sam's Club is owned by Walmart, so they try and copy that way um, as well. Uh, but, um, essentially, uh, so that decision about what product goes on a shelf in an individual Costco is so important. Um, and before you would just have who, the, the random salesperson that was like working in that area for PNG, they would just like pick whatever product they kind of thought. Um, and they would be like, yes, we should put this on the shelf. And so that's just like not a very, it's not hard to beat that in terms of like an optimal outcome. Um, and so the data science team and like, we worked on this problem for a few months and we're like, yeah, like, you know, basically the crux was like, um, you know, some of the questions were like, if you're going to suggest a laundry and you want to do something in laundry, should you have like the powder that like more Hispanic Americans use? Or should you have pods, which like more like white and young and like the young black Americans use, or should you have it in like a liquid form, which is like, you know, older Americans really like to use it as well. And so you could basically do this little drive time analysis where you could buy some data on customers and that like live around a Costco and say like, yeah, I think this type of neighborhood is like, these are the types of people that would probably shop at this Costco and then do a little recommendation on top of it and just blow the um, the other recommendations um, by the regular salespeople out of the water. Um, so what I'm trying to say is like those projects are so impactful to the business that you're just not going to get at like Facebook. Like at Facebook, if you improve like an ad model by like 0.1%, you're like a god. Like you're, <laughs> you're like, oh my god, like this person, let's just give him a VP title like right now. like. <laughs> Because it's everything is like you have data scientists working on these optimizations like crazy. Um, but at, at, at places that just really need data scientists, it can be a really fun place to work. You can learn a whole lot and you can make a real impact um, on a business as an intern, which is very, very rare in, in, in my impression. So uh, long story short, I went there for a couple summers and had you know a, a great time. I enjoyed it quite a bit. The con is that they will pay you significantly less um, than like a big tech company. And so if you ever have an offer from like a big tech company and a, a, a second tier place, you're almost always going to choose the big tech company. Like there's just like not a lot of ground in between where the offer between Facebook. So at the same time where I was interning there, I also got the, the Facebook full-time offer. Um, and so between that and the nonprofit and PNG. Uh, the PNG offer was like half of what the the big tech offer was, um, a, a little bit less than half. Um, oof, yeah, oof. So it's real hard. It's real hard for them to compete. You can understand why they have a hard time hiring data scientists. Um, and you know, some of the other benefits is like 
it's a little cheaper to live in Cincinnati, Ohio, where P&G is, than San Francisco, California, like one of the most expensive places in the world. Um, but uh, all in all, I definitely like, very much encourage it, and it's a, a great learning experience and can help like propel you into the next step that you want. So, so how did you land that P&G internship? What was the secret sauce there? Just a lot of applications, yeah. or was it? Well, they came to campus. That's a really that's a big thing. Is like. Uh, UF is not a target. Like Facebook does not come to campus for UF. Um, they don't like go in at all and come to career fair or at all. They basically like just don't, they don't really, they didn't do it at least that at that time. Neither did a bunch of the other um, tech companies. Google wasn't there. Apple wasn't there. Netflix wasn't there. Amazon wasn't there. Microsoft was there. Um, Amazon was like kind of there a little bit in my like junior and senior year, but almost, almost not at all. They didn't hire lots of people um, out of the university. And so my big, but P&G hired a ton of people at UF. So I was like, well, I can probably get an internship there. And they probably have some data science stuff to do. Um, and I was kind of right on both on, on, on both of those things. Um, the biggest way that I got the P&G internship is honestly like making data science projects that, the, that I could talk about and the recruiters could see. Um, I have this, this metric that I now like, think I, I probably uh, like optimize for and I've been able to uh, enumerate it a little bit better. And it's I try to minimize the number of clicks that a recruiter um, has to, you know, has to click before um, they can actually see work that I've done. Um, so if I give them my resume or if they go to my website, I'll how long does it take? <laughs> yeah, 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 I know exactly. It's like, how long does it take before they see something I've done that they'll be like, oh, that's cool. So if I'm just sending them to like my GitHub, how long does it take for them to get, do they have to click on the right repository and then the right Python file to actually see like the work that I've done and then maybe go, do they have to go through the readme and click this and read that? You know, like if, if that's the case and they're only gonna spend 20 seconds on it, it, like most GitHub repos are just worthless. Like they're never gonna, you know, there's 30 repositories in there and there's only five files that I'm proud of. Like what's a chance like that, that they're actually gonna spend the time to actually go and look at the Python code or something? Like it's just so difficult. Um, they're never gonna do that. Or if I if I send them my Kaggle, like how many recruiters are gonna know what a good Kaggle profile looks like? I, I, not a yeah, lot. Like not yeah, very few. <laughs> very few, very few. Like <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, so, and then maybe I have like a HTML file that I like, I basically export my Jupyter notebook to an HTML file and like send them that link or something or host that, like that's a little better. Um, yeah, but I basically optimized for that, did a bunch of individual data science projects on like the world around me. So one of them was I made a, um, I, I played ping pong like basically every Tuesday and Thursday morning before one of my classes with a, a bunch of, a couple of, yeah, a couple of my friends. I would say a bunch, just two or three of us. <laughs> There's not like a swarm of people playing ping pong at eight in the morning. Um, but we would do it like all the time. And I, and I thought I was like, well, and I would always beat my friend Kent. My friend Kent would always beat my friend Juan and my friend Juan would always beat me. Um, and so we were all like asking each other, like, oh, who's the actual best player? And so then I, I went through and I recorded all of our games for three months. <laughs> And then it. I made this I made this model that I basically used an, an ELO model, which is used in chess, named after Arpad ELO, a very famous chess grandmaster. Um, and you can you it, it will uh, be able to um, help you figure out over time with people uh, like uh, essentially how good each player is. Um, and so you could see when people moved up or down in the rankings and how badly did you beat this other person? You could allocate more points that way. and. Turn, you basically made it into a Jupyter notebook, turned it and like wrote a bunch of markdown, put it on my website and yeah, would talk to recruiters about it because <laughs> everyone knows ping pong and everyone like can imagine that this problem is a real thing. And it's kind of bizarre, right? It's kind of like, it's fun. It's a little dumb and it shows that I can do some Python code and here's the output of it. And I look back on it and it's so bad. It's so bad. Like the code is like the worst code I've ever seen. It's like embarrassing. I always want to take it down. But I don't because it shows like this is like, I think you should always be a little embarrassed about like work that you've done a few years ago because it shows that you're improving. And if you're ever looking at work that you've done a few years ago and you're like, I would do the same thing today. Like you're probably not improving fast enough. Um, you're probably, you're probably at the same, really at the same level. 
Um, yeah, so I, I keep it up there. You can probably like look at it. It's not great, <laughs> but it shows like a nice graph of like, here's my friend that here's like where the different um, people are on the, the ping pong scale and like how that changes over time and has some like nice words around it that I wrote about us playing ping pong. And then like recruiters eat that up. They're like, okay. And from that, a recruiter knows he can code. He knows how to answer questions with data. Boom. That's what you need. <laughs> like that, yeah. that's, that's the problem solving. You can, the communication of the information and the storytelling, right? Like if you just did that project without having any context, right? People would be like, oh, this is a pretty bad project. Yeah, I don't care. But, like, why do I care but yeah, that? if it's like, oh, he collected this data. Oh, he did this because he, they were trying to figure out who was the best out of their friend group. Like that's meaningful. I saw someone do something very similar with uh, Settlers of Catan. <laughs> uh, where they they kept track of all the games they played and created an ELO rating system. I was actually looking into ELO quite a bit this year. We were trying to do it for golf. Yeah. And golf's interesting because you have tournament style format and it makes it interesting to do head to head matchups, uh, which is a whole nother can of worms, but it's pretty, pretty fun, yeah. different style. My interns spearheaded that one. I probably should check that code again, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, double check that one. See what see what's going on yeah. in the background. So in terms of minimizing clicks, what do you think the best way to do that is? Is it to send a project? Is it to have a personal website? You know, something that I usually recommend is having a personal website, but essentially making it a one page app uh, where oh, yeah. you start with little intro, then you have experience, whatever is relevant, but they keep scrolling and they keep seeing new stuff. Um, something about clicking is different than scrolling. Like, I, I guess in 2021, we're just creatures of the scroll. We're, we're <laughs> slaves to the scroll. Um, creatures of the scroll. I love it. That's yeah. so funny. <laughs> it sounds like a horror movie, like creatures of the scroll. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is a little bit of a horror movie sometimes if we think about how much time I spent on Instagram. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not on Monday, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm happy you could make a joke about that. <laughs> oh, for sure. That thing was, oh, my God. I That's assume it wasn't thing, like you a, that, uh, no, that pushed no, the, the code. But as an aside, like a lot of people ask me, they were like, okay, so how many people are going to get fired? Like, because of like Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp going down, you know, for five hours and a really interesting thing about Facebook's culture is it's like, like famously anti-blame where the goal of any, like kind of, we call it SEB review is to, is to figure out what happened and how to prevent it in the future because most of the big issues are kind of like straws that broke the camel's back and you don't really want to blame the straw um, for the, the camel's back being broken because just because it was the last thing that doesn't mean it was the thing. So as long as there's no like malicious intent, um, you know, they will not like get reprimanded probably unless they were doing something that was like really, really like, oh yeah, genuinely like you, you meant to take this down or something, which I, um, have no comments on other than I don't think it happened. Like as far as all the communication, this is not like some state actor thing. My main goal in ever talking about Facebook is never to be the main character. If I'm ever the main character in anything related to Facebook, I've done something horribly wrong. I would like to be a side character only, like a side quest at best, no main character syndrome for anything related to Facebook it will be Understandable. great. Understandable. Well, you something you just described there, I see it really commonly in sports. So a lot of people, they focus on the last shot, right? Like, oh, he was clutch. He hit the last shot of the game or he sunk the putt to win the tournament. And you're like, at least from a data perspective, I'm like, dude, they played the whole game before that. Like there yeah. are infinite things that they could have done before previously that could have changed the outcome. It wasn't just the one shot that mattered. Like, yes, you know, like statistics suggest that they make those shots at about the same probability that they make the other shots that they shoot right <laughs> like, like, yeah as humans we put importance around or we, we give significance to temporal things because it seems like it's more important but in truth a lot of these things are as important as the previous one and that's one of the biggest things at least in my domain in sports analytics that we yeah. have to debunk constantly it's like no yeah. like it, just because it's the most visible like putting for example in golf 
Like just because that's when the ball does go into the hole, it doesn't mean it's more important than the other one. There's just more visible. Yeah, actually, the five bogeys you just shot is more important than, yeah. the, <laughs> than the, the rest tee of shot it. you hit in the woods. Is... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I I digress. I could talk about about that like uh, that time Probably. fallacy all day. Um, I do want to get more into your. Ooh experience breaking into Facebook. Let's, uh, you answered me a question earlier. You asked me a question earlier about like the, the page apps that I want to go back to because I think oh, it's yeah, super sorry, important. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so like I definitely strongly recommend that people have exactly what you said, which is I should be able to go to one website that is probably not GitHub and it's probably not Kaggle. It's your website. It has your name. It has a few sentences, maybe a couple paragraphs of text, and then some things that you've done that I can click on. And as long as you have a website that does that, like you're probably pretty, it's good enough. Um, and yeah, and uh, the, uh, the other thing that um, we haven't talked about as of yet is I spent so much time on these data science projects, but I never actually created anything that, um, I never created anything that was live. Like I never created a live app because I was too scared of it. Like it, felt like building something that was like on Flask or Django or something like, and then trying to deploy it was just, it felt so far out of reach of my skill set. if I'm being totally honest. Like I didn't, I didn't feel like I was an app developer and it felt like I, I tried a few times to basically get into like making React apps, but I didn't really like, I was like, it, it just felt like the barrier going from, I'm going to make something that is a like all text post um, to something that is like, this is a live app was so high. Um, that I just never ended up really doing it for any of the projects. And then um, Streamlit came around and I found about Streamlit and all that just went away. It was That's like, okay, make, yeah. yeah, I was like, okay, this is so much better. Um, where Streamlit, you can basically have a script, like you have a Python script or something, you add a few de a few decorators on top of it, add some Streamlit commands, and like you have a fully fledged app that I can deploy in like minutes, like a half hour. Like if I, when I learned when I first did it, like time number one, me using Streamlit, I had something up like in under an hour. Um, like never had heard of Streamlit before whatsoever. It was like, oh my God. And then there's so much more in terms of getting better at it and like how to like properly format um, and like use all the different columns and all the different features and sidebars and, and whatever else to get good at it. But that first like immediate um, use was so, it was like magical um because it was a problem that i've had for years for years and years you know how much i would have loved to make a little streamlit app around my friends playing ping pong and being like oh just even even the tiniest little input that was like oh what percent of the time should kent beat tyler you know and be able to do a little simulation based on you know the elo data and whatever else and just be able to do that like i would have loved to be able to do that but i was just like mm, yeah no uh that, that's kind of like too much effort. I don't want to spend another month on this um, or another two weeks of like development time on this to make an app. Um, and so if you can have some something on your portfolio where a recruiter or a data science manager can play with the stuff that you've done, I think that just puts you like so far ahead of other of other candidates that are just um just like reading, uh, you know, just have stuff that your know, recruiter can read or something. And the best that um, that I've seen is actually folks that will do take homes in a Streamlit app and then make it so that only the the uh, the like data science manager can actually like go onto their Streamlit app and answer all their questions in an interactive app so that they can play around the with the results. And that is just like next level. Yeah, next level. <laughs> and it's all of a sudden that, that sort of stuff becomes so much, so much easier. Um, uh, yeah, it becomes like so, so much easier with, with Streamlit versus like, I would just never create a, a Django app or a Flask app or a React app for um, like uh, a job that I'm applying to, but I totally would for Streamlit. And um, yeah, mentioned that I uh, like wrote a, a book on this and like one of the chapters is just like how I would go about um, like making a, um, a Streamlit app for a take home section of an interview. Um, Cause I think it's just like, if I was a data science manager and someone made a full, fully fledged app for me, um, I would just be thrilled. I'd be like, wow, this person like actually can do it as long as the stuff in the app is good. Um, and they put on this, uh, this extra effort towards it. That just sounds so cool. To me, that's one of those 80, 20 things, right? Like it, 
provide so much value. It would be so much different than what other people are doing. And the amount of work that it would require would be like maybe 20% extra work. And yeah. that's pretty incredible on that front. I guess that's not exactly how the AD20 rule works, but we're just going to- I wasn't going to correct you on it, yeah. but that's close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's one of the few things that creates so much value, so much return. It's one of those small few things that you should really focus on because uh, you want to be different in a good way. And I think that that is a really compelling way to do that. So I want to talk a lot more on the streamlet. Uh, pre-streamlet, how did you approach the interview process and, and what did you find success in and what was that story like, uh, particularly yeah. with Facebook? Yeah, particularly with Facebook. Um, so the, um, the hardest part about tech companies is getting noticed at all. Um, and then once you're kind of like in this spot about, and I, I can't really talk that much about like the exact Facebook interview process, partially because I interview, like I interview totally lots of sure, candidates, yeah. you know, um, and so that definitely would not, would not be fair to anyone that uh, is not a listener of, <laughs> of your wonderful podcast. Um, but this is kind of how it works across like all the different uh, tech companies where the hardest part is kind of, or one of the really big funnels, I wouldn't say the hardest part, but one of the really big funnels is getting from my application isn't looked at at all to someone looks at my application and then the second step um, that is a really big funnel is someone looks at my application and um, someone actually lets me into the initial interview stage. And then there are funnels like after, after that step. Um, and so I think for, for different candidates that really like your effort um, should be on one of those funnels. So either you think you're like never getting in front of a recruiter at all um, and then your your goal should be, how do I get it so that a recruiter actually picks up my my resume and sees it? And for me, that started out with like, you know, everything from trying to find recruiters on LinkedIn, finding the right recruiter on LinkedIn. Like I, um, you know, went to a lot of different hackathons in college and um, would try to, you know, get my, you know, resume in the hands of different people who would try to do well in the hackathons and make something that they would want to talk about. Um, or that I would want to talk about and, and I want to talk about with them such that like they would actually know who I was and not just some random person talking, you know, talking to them. And like then also if you have any friends um, that have like intern at these places, like a referral is like gold. It's worth its weight in gold in terms of getting to this to the spot where someone is at least looking at this resume at all. Um, referrals probably won't help you after that point. Um, like I've never seen a company that's like, oh yeah, like we didn't think the candidate was great in there, like four interviews, but they were referred. So like, we're just going to let them in. But it's just like that first step, um, is like so, so crucial. Um, just cause there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that apply for data science roles at Facebook, if not millions. Um, so it's like just really, really hard. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that the I would say the the biggest focus should kind of be what is the step that you're really not doing that you think you're not doing well on? Are you getting a lot of like initial phone screens, but then not doing well there? Then maybe some of the stuff you should be doing is yeah, I should be like practicing phone screens with my friends. I should be like trying to be able to talk about my different um, projects. Maybe I should add a couple projects that are kind of easier to talk about um, uh, with recruiters or um, like try to get some, some research in, in an area that I like actually care about. So that's, you know, it's much more conversational and they kind of believe that you can solve some of the problems that um, they think the company actually has. Um, and then if you're getting to, you know, the, the interviews with more technical folks, maybe you're now in the, the full-time interview loops or, you know, um, kind of like the, what are the final, more final stages with these companies. And then if you're not doing well there, um, there, you know, maybe you should practice a bit more on the interviews that uh, you think you're doing worse at. Um, you know, if you're like, feel like you're doing really well when you're in the interviews that are about coding, but really poorly when you're, uh, you know, maybe talking to a manager about like, uh, just like conversationally or something, just like getting practice in whatever you think you're, you're messing up is like the, the key step. And then the other thing to all also recognize is a lot of this stuff is, um, random like you have to think that the false positive and false negative rates for interviews are like um they're high they're they're high 
Yeah, they're high. And the idea is that false positives are extremely expensive, whereas a false negative is less expensive because the application pool is so big. Um, and so when you're optimizing for to minimize the false positive rate, um, you might set a higher bar. You might just like, even if you get any sort of negative signals or an interview thinks that something is negative, you might just like, like not accept the candidate, which is just natural when you're thinking about it as like a data science problem. Like, do you want precision or do you want recall here? Um, and in this case, like precision is super important where recall is a little bit less important, um, not to like bring it down to uh, precision and recall terms because there's obviously so much, so many human like uh, interactions here. Uh, but yeah, like you just have, kind of have to recognize a lot that you may do really well in an interview. You can be super proud of your outcome. And it might be that like, you know, it, it's like in golf, exactly like in golf, you're like you may be yeah. super proud of your proud uh, of, of your practice. You've gotten so much better at putting and you've gotten your putting rate up to 95% or something within like 15 feet. And then you happen to miss one and you're like, well, that was kind of the one in 20. Like, I know I've gotten better at this. I shouldn't be not proud of the work that I've done. Um, but this is just kind of how how the, the die rolls sometimes. And it's really, really difficult emotionally. Um, yeah, and mentally to like get over those barriers. And yeah, I mean, I just like, I still have, I still have my list of when I was applying to all the companies of like, and it, you just go down it. It's just rejection, 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 rejection. Like back to back, so much effort put into these, and just there. It, it just it really, really is painful to get rejected a lot of times. Um, but your goal is optimizing the swings at the bat, not your batting average. Um, and as long as you have better swings at the bat, um, you're kind of like a Babe Ruth type player when you're doing interviews, where your goal is you want to you want to you don't really care about if you strike strike out a bunch like you only need to get one home run um and so you want to get as many shots on at the plate swing hard um and swing a lot i really like so many things that you said in that uh i mean the first is the fact that you had a list right everyone that has success or that everyone that i've talked to that's had success at the large tech companies they collected data from their interviews right you were very articulate about how, what part of the process were you failing in or were you struggling with, right? And the only yeah. way you find that out is if you track it, right? The only way that you can evaluate. And, and so many people are like, oh, I have to do all this studying before I have to do all this preparation. Yes, you should prepare, but like there's a limitless amount of things you can prepare for an interview. If you're going in and you're testing yourself, you're going in and you're seeing where you're deficient, that points you to exactly where you should be improving. So you're significantly more efficient if you're going in and doing interviews and testing and getting this feedback loop, maybe even a little bit before you're ready. Like if there's a company you really, really want to work for, like maybe don't do that first, but yeah. like <laughs> you can interview at plenty of, of other places and get feedback and learn. And like, you should be learning something from every single interview that you have. And I think that that's just like something people don't realize. They're just so scared and so intimidated and they want to do everything right, but like we should be collecting data. We should be learning. This is this is an iterative process. Yeah, I basically only get information from my failures. Like I get very little information from my successes in comparison to the information I get from my failures. Um, and that's not completely true, but you kind of have to convince yourself of it to put yourself in a position to fail a lot, um, which is all of data science interviewing, unless you're of course, like uh, a god <laughs> that just like gets an offer every time they like you know apply to a company and even even like after you Jeff work at a Lee. yeah <laughs> right right you just get offers just everywhere just they just fall into your lap from on high but for the rest of us that are not that um you're going to get rejected a lot and you have to recognize that otherwise it's just it's gonna be it's gonna be a rough time absolutely so we only have a little bit of time left but i wanted to make sure we talked a little bit more about your book. We're obviously doing a giveaway on the podcast for people that comment below. And I wanted to hear more of that story. We heard a little bit about it before, but anything you wanted to add about that experience or what people can hope to, to get out of reading that? I know I will be definitely picking up a copy because I love Streamlit and I want to get better at it. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, 
definitely the the way that it ended up working out is I started messing around with Streamlit and I started like making different Streamlit apps um, that I thought were interesting. I would make them kind of at work and then also um, for uh, just like other personal projects. And it was just like night and day better than um, every other like uh, a web app creation format I've ever done. Like it's just like, yeah, so, so much better such that I started a lot of the analyses that I would do, like I would just import Streamlit at the top just out of reaction in the same way that like very often I'll import NumPy like in projects where I might not exactly use it, but I just assume that I'm going to probably need it at some point in the analysis. And as soon as I started doing that, I was like, oh, this is a default library for me that is up there with, you know, pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and maybe scikit-learn. Um, I was like, oh, this has become like the fifth default library in my data science workflow that I import all the time. Uh, let's talk to the Struma folks and, you know, see what they're doing. And they've, they're super, super nice. And um, awesome. they, yeah, they're like, it's like a company value of theirs to be nice or something, but like they're just the nicest people online, um, which is kind of rare in Python. Not all Python people are as nice as like an R. R, people are extraordinarily like, nice. Like Hadley Wickham, he's the nicest person on the internet. Like It's like unbelievable. It's like, how are you so nice dealing with like all the people that ask you the same question like time and time again for 15 years? Um, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. Same thing with Streamlink. They, they're incredibly, incredibly nice. Um, and they invited me into their creators program, which is uh, kind of for folks that have like created a lot of Streamlit apps and they want them to create more. So they, so they asked them to be creators basically. Um, and I did that for a while. I started like writing some blog posts about it. And then a, a book publisher came around and they were like, you know, you write these blog posts, would you write like to write a longer blog post? The one that is maybe 300 pages long <laughs> instead, of, instead of just a few. Um, and I was like, yeah, this sounds like a really great use of my pandemic time. Um, and the other thing um, uh, that I, is really important is like, I learned a lot from reading full length books on topics. Like I learned so much from like uh, Joel Gruss's like uh, data science from scratch um, or like machine learning handbook or like um, even, even the basics when I was back in um, statistics lands, like introduction to statistical learning and R like ISLR was like, I would just, you know, read these books and want to understand like a lot of the fundamentals about how these things worked. And so because that was the learning experience that I always had, I wanted to be able to replicate that in something that I thought was quite important. Um, and so it was a little bit of a no brainer for me to say yes to the book publisher and, and go ahead and, and write on it. And um, the things that I really wanted to cover and ended up did covering is not just what are the fundamentals of Streamlit and how do you actually use it, but also how do all these different puzzle pieces kind of interact in ways that can answer some of the problems that you have? Like, how can you read this and get a really good toolkit such that you can use it in job applications, such that you can use it in, uh, you can use it at work, such that you can use it to answer machine learning problems or data analysis problems. Um, yeah, and so then all the chapters are really focused on, like a, a lot of them are very application focused and how do you make the, the prettiest Streamlit apps? How do you make efficient Streamlit apps? Like. Um, lots and lots of examples, um, all that stuff is just like, you know, the, the bread and in my view, the bread and butter of writing technical books is giving people a good skill set. Um, and then the last couple chapters are very interview focused where I interview a bunch of different Streamlit creators and ask them where they think the Streamlit platform is going. And, you know, I talked to Adrian, who's the founder of Streamlit and Charlie, who does a bunch of, um, a Streamlit, um, applications for, uh, then he applies it to the SEO world and Fanilo, who, uh, makes a lot of Streamlit components. Um, and it's just like a really fun guy altogether. And Johannes, who actually like worked, uh, he worked on Streamlit stuff for a while and then he got hired by Streamlit. And so when I had like asked him to interview, he was like just making a bunch of cool stream machine learning Streamlit apps. And then he ended up like being a production That's engineer for them, awesome. which is just really fun. Um, yeah, so that's that's the crux of it. I learn a lot from books. I love books. I read a lot. Um, and I love like learning from technical books as well. I love that. And I think it's important to debunk. I think I've heard some places around the internet that like, oh, why would anyone learn from books anymore? There's all these beautiful courses, whatever it is. I think that that's a complete fallacy. Like people learn from the mediums that, that they enjoy. And if you like books, you can absolutely learn data science, machine learning, streamlet, whatever it might, it might be from a book. Um, there are benefits, right? Like if you're reading a book, 
you're not distracted by all the emails and all the stuff on your computer, your glowing screens, whatever yeah. it might be. So I want to make sure I come out and publicly say, I personally learn from books. I also learn from courses <laughs> in other places. You come out pro but, book. You're coming yeah, out pro book. Pro, I can't pro believe book. it. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> groundbreaking news there. So uh, thank you again for, for coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, how can people find out more about you? Uh, what's the best place for them to, to check you out? Best place is my one page website that has a few different paragraphs and a bunch I'll of other stuff below. below it. <laughs> yeah, link it below. And then I talk about Streamlit on Twitter. Uh, I used to talk about other things and then I started writing about Streamlit and now I just talk about Streamlit. And they'll so, be able to uh, see your Twitter handle right below your face there. So <laughs> great. Perfect. Well, it was so great coming on. Thank you so much. We always have a great time talking. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. I greatly enjoyed it.